Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, General Lyles, uh, the director of the uh, uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Office, and uh, uh, Major General Franklin are here to talk about uh, uh, the work of uh, uh, on THAAD and other programs, and it's on the record, and uh, it'll take uh, a reasonable number of questions after it's over. General Lyles. Okay, good afternoon. Well, first let me uh, do a disclaimer, if I could. Uh, contrary to the uh, published reports in one medium yesterday that I was going to come here to announce a restructure of the THAAD program, uh, that was grossly in error. There was never intent to do that at all. Instead, uh, we recognized for some time that since the 12th May last test of the, the uh, THAAD missile, uh, when we had another intercept failure, that we have been, had a dearth of information we provided to the, uh, to the media. And so I wanted to take the opportunity, along with uh, Major General Pete Franklin from the Army, uh, to come up here and fill you in on the blanks, if you will, tell you what has been happening with the THAAD program, uh, tell you where we are in resolving the problems, and then obviously opening the floor for any questions that you might have. Uh, what I'd like to do is to give you an update on the THAAD uh, failure and the THAAD program, uh, to include the analysis of the last flight, the flight test number eight, where we had the difficulties, our discussions with our uh, contractor team, the failure analysis activity and destruction uh, discussions with the contractor team, and our approach for the next flight and where we see ourselves going in the future. Uh, let me just start, if you will, with the uh, sort of a reacquaintance of the THAAD program. Uh, some of you out there we don't deal with on a daily basis, and so you may not be as familiar with the THAAD program. As you know, the acronym stands for Theater High Altitude Area Defense, and the THAAD system consists of a, an interceptor missile, uh, its radar, uh, a launcher, and a battle management command and control element. The entire system is designed to destroy enemy ballistic missiles, and THAAD is intended to be deployed overseas to protect our troops, our friends and allies, against a type of more advanced ballistic missiles our enemies could use against our deployed forces or against our allies in the future. <clears throat> Let me just start by saying that, uh, and I want to emphasize, both for me as the director of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, and I think I speak uh, for sure for the United States Army, the Army and BMDO remain fully committed to the THAAD program. The THAAD is a critical element of our family of systems approach for theater ballistic missile defense. Uh, it is one of the key elements of this uh, uh, family of systems approach, along with the upgrades we're making to the Patriot program, uh, Patriot Advanced Capability 3 or PAC-3, the Navy lower tier system, the counterpart to the PAC-3 for the Navy element, Navy Area Defense is the title we give to that, the upper tier system for the Naval component or Navy Theater Wide, and of course THAAD. And in the future, that family of systems architecture will include uh, programs we hope like the Airborne Laser and perhaps a Medium Extended Air Defense System or, or MEADS. Our TMD architecture is multi-tiered, as you can tell from the comments I just described. It's multi-tiered or multi-layered. It has an upper tier component that gives broad coverage uh, defense, has a lower tier uh, capability for providing point defense. The THAAD system specifically will provide an effective defense against the longer range theater class of missile threats, the type we see proliferating around the world today. And I don't need to go into details with uh, this audience as to some of the kind of things and indicators we've seen around, around the world. THAAD will allow us to intercept those kinds of ballistic missiles at higher altitudes and longer ranges than we can currently achieve. And this is very critically important when we're talking about the possibility of dealing with warheads that may have weapons of mass destruction on top of them, be they chemical, biological, or, or God forbid, nuclear. When linked in this family of systems architecture with PAC-3, the Navy Area System, or Navy Upper Tier, THAAD provides a critical multi-tier defense that significantly improves the effectiveness of the, of the overall theater missile defense architecture. Let me reiterate again, uh, we're fully committed to making sure that the program is successful, that that program is successful, to proving out the missile and the entire system as part of our development aspect, and to proceed into the next phase of the program so we can begin fielding the system as quickly as we possibly can. I thought it might be very helpful just to illustrate in the tests that we've done for the THAAD program. We've conducted eight tests. Uh, this was flight test number eight that, was, uh, tried, that we conducted on the 12th of, of May. Uh, the chart that you see up there is a matrix that sort of illustrates the kinds of success or lack of success we've had in the program to date. 
the real bottom line of all of this is that most of the THAAD system, the overall system, when you consider both the missile, the radar, the battle management command and control, the launcher, most of the system has worked extremely well. We've had great success with the radar, great success with the battle management command and control, great success with the launcher. All of those parts of the total system have worked very, very well. The part that's uh, probably the most critical, however, the part that we're very concerned about is the missile, and that's the one we've had difficulty with. The five failures we've had, the five intercept failures we've had on the, on the THAAD missile have all been from fa different failure mechanisms, five different failure mechanisms to be exact. They've not been in the same components. They've not been in the same phase of the program or fa uh, uh, part of the program. They've been five random, if I can use their terminology, uh, different failure modes, five different separate uh, failure modes. This causes us a lot of concern, and that's what we've been trying to address as we try to solve the problems. Let me tell you a little bit about flight test number eight and what we're doing to try to recover from it, and it's uh, the failure analysis activity. Uh, BMDO and the Army uh, conducted flight test number eight on the 12th of May, and as you're all aware, obviously, we experienced a major technical difficulty right after launch, within a couple of seconds after launch out of the, the launcher. The missile ended up going into a loop. Part of that was pre-programmed, but it never came out of that loop. Uh, and ended up sort of self-destructing because of the way it's designed. It did never achieve the altitudes and accelerations it was intended to achieve during this test. So it has a built-in self-destruction mechanism, and that's what eventually uh, caused the self-destruction at White Sands Missile Range. <clears throat> BMDO, the Army, and the contractor, the entire contractor team, are conducting a thorough, very thorough failure analysis. And while this analysis is currently ongoing, uh, un underway, we believe right now that the most likely cause of the failure was a component failure, a short circuit to be exact, in the thrust vector control mechanism for the THAAD missile. Both we and the contractor, the contractor and the government, have agreed to the failure analysis plan, this detailed plan that's currently underway. It is basically a methodical approach to review all of the available data associated not only with this particular test and this particular missile, but all the previous tests one more time to make sure we understand if there's any connectivity between the different things, and to conduct a full and thorough fault tree analysis to look for the root causes of the things that have caused our problem. I fully expect that our team of experts, both the contractor and government experts, will be able to identify that root cause and define areas requiring corrective actions within the next few weeks. They've been working this since, obviously, literally seconds after the 12th of May failure. And I expect to receive, uh, personally, the final report and the results of that failure analysis later this month. And as soon as we've completed all specs of that uh, analysis, uh, I plan to either personally or we will have somebody in the Army or BMDO prepared to share that information with you. All of you are also, I think, familiar with the fact that we issued shortly after the failure something we call a cure notice to the prime contractor, to Lockheed Martin. Uh, for those not familiar with it, a cure notice is a contractual arrangement. It's a statement of dissatisfaction with the performance under a contract. It's a notification to a contractor that we expect him to uh, execute the remedies and define the remedies to solve a specific problem. Uh, in this case, we issued the cure notice to Lockheed Martin shortly after the flight test uh, number uh, eight failure. And uh, we have subsequently received their initial response to that cure notice, their initial um, plans for how to resolve the problem, their plans for what we do next within the program. Uh, we have that response. We've looked at it in uh, some detail, but we are in what we call negotiations with Lockheed Martin to refine the specifics associated with the cure notice response. Some aspects of it we liked, some aspects of it we thought needed to be better defined. To give you just a quick overview of some parts of the cure notice, Lockheed Martin presented uh, somewhat of a new organizational structure for managing the rest of the THAAD program. They specifically identified a key individual uh, who I happen to know from other programs in the space realm of uh, development activities in the Department of Defense, a specific individual, a troubleshooter shooter that they're bringing in or have brought in to specifically work the test program aspect of the THAAD program. That troubleshooter will work along with the rest of the THAAD management team uh, to execute the rest of the program, but he will focus specifically on getting successfully through the rest of the test aspects of the program. They've identified five review teams, detailed independent review teams, who are looking at every aspect they can of this missile, the rest of the program, the previous failures, 
the processes that Lockheed Martin has for quality control, reliability control, manufacturing, testing, et cetera. Uh, these independent review teams include uh, expert not, experts not just from the Lockheed Martin Division in Sunnyvale, California, where the THAAD program is uh, run, but throughout the entire Lockheed Martin corporate structure, and particularly from their astronautics department uh, or division in Denver, uh, where most of their space program, programs are run. By the way, this troubleshooter I mentioned earlier also came from the astronautics uh, uh, division. They brought in experts from down at Cape Canaveral, uh, specifically one individual who has led all of their flight test activities, success activities for all their space programs uh, down at uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, this specific individual was also the leader of the uh, NASA and shuttle launch activities down at the, uh, uh, down at the Cape in the, in the past years, somebody with an excellent track record. In addition to those five review teams that are looking at the various aspects of the program, uh, we are negotiating, as I uh, hinted earlier, an arrangements towards uh, something that's somewhat unique, a cost-sharing aspect for the program. In this case, we're asking the contractor, and they have volunteered, uh, willingness to support some aspects of the costs associated with the THAAD missile tests if we continue to have failures. This uh, cost-sharing arrangement is somewhat unique. We're in the process of negotiating the details right now with Lockheed Martin. I am not prepared today to talk about specific dollar amounts, et cetera, except to tell you that it is significant, uh, a major, major commitment of uh, support uh, and commitment to the program on the part of Lockheed Martin. Uh, and we are, again, working the specific details and we'll be prepared to talk to, to you more about that uh, uh, in subsequent weeks or days. Uh, during all these negotiations, I think it's important to point out, as indicated by this cost share arrangement uh, and other things that uh, they have done, that Lockheed Martin senior management from the corporate headquarters here in Bethesda uh, to their uh, leadership of the program out at Sunnyvale, California, and every other aspect of the corporate structure of Lockheed have expressed and shown complete and absolute commitment to making sure that that program is going to be successful. I'll give you one indication of that uh, that I think is, uh, again, somewhat unusual and unprecedented, but a sign of very strong commitment. As part of bringing in independent people to help them uh, analyze and figure out uh, what caused the problems and where we need to go from here, uh, Lockheed Martin has reached out to other corporations, other companies that have missile experience, and specifically in this case, Raytheon Corporation. Uh, as you may know, with mergers and other things in, uh, throughout our country over the last years or so, uh, Raytheon Corporation, Raytheon Hughes, if I can, and TI, for that matter, uh, probably have more tactical missile experience than any other corporation in the United States. Lockheed Martin is now reaching out to Raytheon, their missile people, to help them to identify the failures, identify what the problems are, relook at the design, and help uh, make sure that we can make this program a success. I think that's a very positive step forward, and it sh again shows the commitment on the part of the contractor, Lockheed Martin, to make this program a success. Let me talk about the next step ahead, if I could, flight test number nine. Uh, we're looking forward to proceeding with the program. And originally, we had stated right after the flight test failure on the 12th of May that we were possibly looking at a next test, flight test number nine, in August of this, uh, this year, uh, this summer. Uh, after looking at where we are in the failure analysis and looking at some of the questions that still need to be answered, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to make this summer. We are looking for the fall time frame, however, as a good point uh, by which we might be ready to execute the next test. We want to complete all the failure analysis first to make sure we understand any corrective actions that might be necessary. The bottom line is we're going to fly when we are ready to fly. But right now, I think that might be sometime later uh, this fall or later this calendar year, the fall, fall time frame. Uh, I'd like to caution, however, one thing, particularly for those who saw the actions that took place between flight test number seven, the failure we had last year, and flight test number eight that we just tried to execute successfully, uh, and obviously did not do so. We do not anticipate a lengthy delay in this particular case. There were some 14 or 15 months between flight test number seven and flight test number eight. We think we understand through last, the last failure analysis we did and the things we're looking at in this particular case that we should be able to return to fly uh, in relatively short order, uh, certainly nothing like the kinds of delays that we experienced before. Uh, through the government independent reviews that took place the last time, the reviews of these five teams that Lockheed Martin has, we think we fairly, are fairly comfortable with the design of the missile. 
uh, engineering and putting together everything, making it work together in terms of quality and reliability and consistency is probably the key focus area, and that's the kind of thing that we hope to be able to resolve very, very quickly. Let me close if I could, and then I'll open the floor for any questions. Uh, again, reiterate that most of the elements of the THAAD system, the total system, have worked extremely well and given us great, great confidence in not only their design, but their ability to support not just the THAAD program, but potentially other aspects of our missile defense architecture. This includes, again, the radar, the launcher, the battle management command and control. However, uh, we're not naive, obviously. We realize that the heart of the THAAD is the bullet. That's the thing that really makes missile defense a success and what missile defense is all about. And we're committed to making that THAAD missile work. I, I might, uh, just closing, you might imagine that with the anomalies we've experienced on the THAAD program, uh, the schedule delays, et cetera, uh, we are obviously within the Department of Defense looking at ways that we may have to restructure the program. I said earlier I wasn't going to announce the restructure. I will obviously tell you that uh, we are evaluating options for how we might have to revise the program. Uh, those revisions are sort of fact of life changes, if you will, because of the schedule slips. They also are part of the overall reviews that we are taking here within the Department of Defense to look at all of our missile defense programs, not just that, in terms of budget realities. We not only want to have programs that are effective and can complete, uh, complete the mission, but also that are affordable. So we're looking at the entire family and will be doing so as part of the overall budget review deliberations that are taking place this summer. Our bottom line, however, for THAAD and what we're looking at, if we do have to make any restructure, is to make sure whatever we do reduces the technological risk associated with the program, uh, where there may still be some, and preparing us better to enter into the next phase of the program, but more importantly, to minimize any slip we may have to the fielding date, because we desperately need to have this capability to support our warfighters. With that, I appreciate your, your patience. Now, I'll open the floor for any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, General. Uh, the five failures that you showed on the chart each had a different separate cause. Has the, the, the causes of those five failures and the, the, one, the last one all been cured uh, or those problems have been alleviated so that no failure has duplicated itself? So there's a forward progress then in the, in the, in the refining of this missile, is that correct? Uh, that is correct with the exception obviously of the last one since we're still doing the failure analysis, we haven't uh, made the exact correction or taken the corrective action for the last failure. But for the other four, uh, those specific mechanisms were resolved. Uh, we, uh, as part of that, and one of the things I think is very important over the last year, we've introduced uh, some additional testing methodologies so we can make sure that those types of things uh, will not occur on, from the four that, I, that uh, were prior to this one. So we have done that. Uh, but you've illustrated something and others may also have questions about, uh, part of the complexity of the problem. If we had had a, a failure mechanism that continued to repeat itself in one element, uh, it's sometimes easier to get to the root cause, make corrective action, redesign, et cetera, when you have that kind of scenario. When you have a, a random failure, and I realize nothing is ever random, uh, but a failure that uh, uh, mechanizes itself in different methods each time, it makes it a little bit more difficulty to get uh, to the root cause of everything. But that's what we're trying to do. Yes? Um, uh, since I'm left hand, I'm going to go left to right if you could. Just go right. <laughs> okay. Um, um, as far as Raytheon's contribution, I know there was talk over the last couple of weeks and months about bringing on another contractor. Will they be given subcontractor status on the program, or is this just bringing in a couple no, of No, let me clarify that. Uh, Raytheon is already a subcontractor on the THAAD program. Raytheon, Raytheon is the, the corporation that designs and builds the radar, but that is a different segment of the Raytheon Corporation. Uh, the thing I alluded to earlier was asking uh, the missile sector of Raytheon to help work with Lockheed Martin, not as a subcontract or anything like that, uh, consultant, advisor, to make sure the design and the design approach and the failure things we're looking at is, is sound. How much money have you spent on that so far, and how much more money are you willing to spend before you decide maybe it's not the way to go? We spent about, uh, overall, for the program from the time it began to, to, to date, about $3.2 billion on the program. Uh, the answer to the latter question is one that uh, uh, is depending on how well we can get through the recent problems and get through success for the, for the program. We want to be able to get it into uh, the intercept regime where we can actually make sure that this mechanism for missile defense really works, upper tier, using hit-to-kill lethality, 
uh, and then uh, execute that successfully so we can get into procurement. Uh, I'm not prepared to answer how much more we're willing to spend. Obviously, affordability is a major concern on all of our programs in the Department of Defense, and so we're trying to drive the costs down for the future while at the same time solve these particular problems. You haven't reached the point where you think you're throwing good money after bad. Uh, I, I don't think so, and, and I say that cautiously. Uh, I don't think so because we're, we're making progress, particularly as you saw from that matrix, the successes we've had on the program. Uh, and I am confident that we can solve the problem with the missile so we can get to a capability that's needed to support our warfighters. What kind of restructuring of the program are you considering? And it's $3.2 billion since the program began when? Uh, the program began shortly after, in, in earnest, as a THAAD program, shortly after Desert Storm. And I'll have to get back to you or get somebody to clarify the specific date for that. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. And the uh, question of what you're considering uh, as possible research. Well, we're obviously looking at how many more tests do we need to do, how many tests do we need to have to proceed to the next phase of the program, uh, when those tests should occur. Uh, should we focus those tests for different mechanisms or to address different uh, uh, questions or technologies and what we had originally planned? Uh, what the bottom line will be in the end in terms of an end date for fielding the system? Those are the kinds of things that we're examining. So if you don't mind, I've been keeping this very patient. Uh, I just wondered if you would give us your best estimate, maybe it's a best guess, of when Fed would uh, be ready for the troops. and. Given that date of your best estimate or best guess, what do you see as the enemy threat at that time? Okay. Um, the original or current plan, I should say, for the THAAD program is to have a capability by uh, FY06, the first unit equipage by uh, 2006. That's the current program. Uh, I hesitate on giving you any other date for that because that's the kind of thing we're looking at in terms of our, our restructure. Even with the failure that we had, the most recent failure, if we can get back on track, solve the problems, we can still execute what's necessary to go to the next phase of the program. And what is necessary is three, uh, three intercept successes in a row, uh, excuse me, not in a row, three out of five intercept successes to proceed to the next phase of the program. Uh, so we still can do that and maintain that schedule, though it's very, very problematic as to whether or not that can all occur in, in the right time. So I don't want to tell you that we've slipped past 06 yet. Okay. If 10 was full confidence that you could make the deployment date of 2006, where is your confidence level right now that you will make 2006? <laughs> when you'll be able to deploy THAAD with the troops. My, my mother told me not to be a betting man, so I, I hate to give you an odds like that because it puts me in the betting well, regime. But, but I am confident. You're I'm confident. confident we'll be able to get a capability to support your troops, right. and we're trying to make that as close to the original uh, fielding date as we possibly can. General, how real is the prospect that you will bring on a second source for this program, either a leader follower or some other regime? And will that be by choice or will that be by congressional direction? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going to come out from Congress. I think they're going to ask us to consider this, and we are obviously considering this as one of our uh, potential uh, alternatives, uh, restructuring the program. Uh, I might just uh, caveat something we've also told the Congress, and, and they understand this. Um, the second source, depending on when you do it on a program, is not necessarily a panacea. Uh, we have to look at all the ramifications of doing such a thing, and that's the kind of thing we're examining very closely. The cost for bringing on a second source, uh, the, the time it takes to bring on a second source, uh, whether or not you ask a second source to do a Chinese copy, that is, bring, build the same missile to print or to have a competing design. There are lots of questions like that that need to be answered before uh, and addressed before we can formally answer that question and get back to Congress. And I'm hoping what the Congress will ask us to do uh, is exactly what we are doing, is that examine all those alternatives and consider them uh, before we reach a final conclusion. Yes. General Congressman Kurt Weldon has talked about the possibility of allowing an enhanced Israeli Aero missile be able to come in and compete with the Lockheed Martin design and then be made it possibly with the THAAD radar and BMCQ. How could or how do you feel about that from Stan, I don't have any specific comments about that because we have not looked at that sort of architecture and uh, and whether it works. Our focus right now, working with these Israelis, and I just returned from Israel just a couple of days ago, is to make the aero system itself work. There are enough challenges with that, and to make the THAAD system work. Uh, we have not examined any hybrid or anything of that of that nature. General, I have a question about the <coughs> Patriot missile. I don't know if it would be better for you or, or perhaps General Franklin, but uh, what level – you talked about the upgraded Patriot. What, how effective uh, – what level of protection does that provide? And 
Is that PAC, Patriot PAC-3 deployed anywhere now, and is it very widely deployed? Um, this is, um, let me answer the question, but I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear because it may be a little bit confusing to some who don't understand our, our configurations that, that we have. Um, the Patriot that was used in Desert Storm obviously uh, had some effect in this, but we have been embarking on a more robust Patriot system to meet the, uh, meet the threat. We have uh, Patriot Pack 2s, Patriot Advanced Capability 2s, which are in the field today with something we call a GEM, Guidance Enhanced Missile. Uh, and the capabilities provided by that system that is fielded today, and oh, by the way, was in uh, the Middle East to support anything that may have happened in Iraq earlier this year, uh, that system can counter today's threat. What we're doing with PAC-3 is a more advanced system still with greater capabilities against uh, systems that may have weapons of mass destruction in the warhead uh, and systems that may have a little bit longer range than, than today's threat. But what we have in the field today, the PAC-2 with this guidance enhanced missile, can counter today's threat. We've actually proven that, by the way, in flight tests uh, last year. I think some people are aware of that. Is that a hit to kill? That is not hit to kill. Uh, hit to kill, it will be a splash frag warhead. Hit to kill is a mechanism of lethality we will be building in for the first time with the PAC-3. Uh, PAC the film lies about the second source issue. Um, it seems that to Lockheed it's pretty apparent that a second source is necessary. I mean, uh, according to what you just said, uh, that's what they're doing. Um, they're going out to Raytheon, they're asking Raytheon to come in and help them fix the problem. Um, Not the true definition of second source. Second source actually gets off and does a design and builds something. In the case that I just described, what Lockheed Martin is doing is, is asking another corporation for advice and uh, some consultancy, if you will. That's, that is not, uh, not a second source at all. Basically the same design, though, if it's the uh, management concerns, which they have been, uh, I mean, the concerns you've I'm had sorry, have been, I've missed the, first part the concerns that. have been management concerns, so there's nothing to bar you from bringing in a, a, another company to build the same design, just build it properly. Um, I'm not sure if we can say that it's been management. Uh, processes are what we fo we're focusing on, quality, reliability, all the other systems engineering processes. Those aren't management uh, concerns per se. Uh, they do get down to the heart of engineering, systems engineering, uh, systems integration. That's, uh, uh, that's the kind of thing that we're focusing on, in addition to verifying that the design is a, is a sound one. So you're saying if there were a second source, it would be a different design. They would not rebuild the Lockheed design. Uh, I, I don't know. That's, again, as I answered earlier, the kind of thing we're looking at very closely uh, as part of our response, not only internally, but response to Congress and making sure we consider that but answer all the tough questions. We, we have not decided that yet. Well, let me ask one last thing. How much money is Raytheon getting from Lockheed to do this? Oh, gracious. I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, in all honesty, and I don't know if it's anything. I think it's advice, if you will, and consultant to help them to take a look at it. Uh, we can get you a better answer for that when we get our, through our negotiations with Lockheed. I honestly do not know. Let me go over this. Two time. questions. One, the, the failure mechanism was this sloppy quality control or what? I mean, what's the what's the emerging? And two, this negotiations that's ongoing. Are we talking about tweaking around the edges here, or is this solid negotiating that it could fall apart in the next week or two or three? Oh no, it's uh, it's it's certainly it's solid negotiation. We're not talking about something that could could fall apart. We're talking about negotiating the arrangements in this cure notice response from Lockheed Martin, and specifically the aspect that has to do with cost sharing. Uh, I think we uh, we're pretty uh, on sound, pretty good on sound grounds relative to the kinds of things we think they are offering and what we would like to see. We're leaving up to the contracting experts to figure out and negotiate the specific details. Uh, there was a first part of your question. You bless this thing in general and you're, you're dealing with man. We blessed the concept of having a cost sharing arrangement and we think that's a, a good thing not only to show commitment on the part of the contractor but also it uh, takes some of the onus off the, uh, not responsibility off of the government, uh, but it shows that uh, if something happens in the future in terms of failures, that the contractor is stepping up with his money uh, to help uh, defray some of the costs associated with this development. Failure. The, Sloppy workmanship or what? We, we don't know. We're, again, that's part of the root cause analysis that we're undergoing to try to find out exactly what happened. We know it was a short circuit. I think any one of you know uh, just from everyday things we have around the household, you can have things like short circuits that aren't necessarily uh, the result of uh, sloppy quality or something of that nature. But we're, again, we're looking at those kind of things. If, Let if me. Is the report accurate that the cost sharing will involve uh, fines of up to $100,000 a day if, if there's a uh, test failure? Uh, I, I don't know where that number came from. Uh, we've talked about 
uh, any kinds of different numbers relative to how to uh, count or bookkeep uh, this cost sharing arrangement. Uh, we, uh, I, that's not a completely accurate statement. What about the figure of 15 million per test up to five, 75 million total, is that accurate? Those are the kind of things that we're looking at, uh, but again, I do not want to talk about specific details until we've had a chance to finish the negotiations with, the, uh, with Lockheed Martin. What is the total cost of each test? Well, the total cost of each test to the government uh, um, is a significant amount, and uh, that's a broad statement. Uh, let me get back to you with a, with a correct yeah, number. Let me follow up on this whole business of cost sharing for one second. Even though you don't have the final numbers yet, philosophically, and you don't know the cause, but philosophically, what do you think is the government's responsibility to pay for, and what would be the contractor's responsibility? Because you've talked a lot in the past about systems engineering and design. So what would the government theoretically, what, what's your view on what the government would be liable to pay for, and why shouldn't the contractor pay the whole load since they haven't managed to fulfill the The general contract. principle that we're looking at in this cost sharing arrangement, and again, this is part of our negotiation, is that uh, the government should still pay for government costs. Uh, I should not expect to have the contractor uh, pay for the program office in Huntsville or my people who are involved in, uh, uh, in the THAAD program or to pay the, the government costs for uh, the range activity at White Sands Missile Range. But there are obviously contractor costs, particularly the team of people uh, at Sunnyvale. And those are the kind of things we're negotiating with them, that if we have subsequent failures, we want them to pay a significant amount uh, for the contractor share of the, uh, of the, of the program. Well, is it your feeling, how much of it is your feeling that the contractor should pay for the failure of this program so far? This, where the negotiations we have, the current cost-sharing arrangement, is looking at the future. We have not talked about going back and uh, getting uh, any uh, funding back for the failures we've had today. We're talking about subsequent. This future is because it has failed so far. So is, do you think the contractor should pay for, for the future because it only exists because you've got In terms of the flight test activity, that's what we're negotiating in the, this cost-share arrangement. And that's all we've talked about in, in the flight tests uh, that are yet to come for the program. Whether the tests of successes or failures are only if they're failures. Only if they're failures. That's the, uh, the sort of bottom line. Let me go back to the back of the room here as we be a little fair. Could you give us a status update, please, on the MEADS program? And as a follow-up to that, uh, your foreign partners have expressed a lot of concern about the U.S. commitment to the program. Could you please address that? Okay. Uh, MEADS is, uh, as I stated earlier at the very beginning, uh, MEADS in terms of a capability. I, I will hold off on talking about the program per se. Having a maneuvering air defense system uh, to go with the maneuver forces uh, for our warfighters is a vital part of the uh, architecture we need for missile defense. Uh, MEADS is obviously the program we have currently embarked upon with the Germans and the Italians to try to make that a reality. Uh, the issue we have is trying to, one, define the program, uh, but also trying to figure out how to fit it within our, our overall missile defense budget. And where we are right now is uh, uh, in the process of looking at the alternatives, looking at the cost uh, plans for the program, and defining all that, uh, and vetting that as part of our budget reviews for all of our missile defense programs this summer. It is one of the things we're looking at and uh, trying to determine how we can fit it into our overall budget, uh, uh, budget this summer. We'll go over this corner now. Right. General Lyles, um, if you don't know the root cause yet of the last failure, and you had thoroughly scrubbed this program and made uh, changes before this test that, that you were confident going into this test were necessary. Why all this flurry of activity now, again, to relook at the whole thing, to uh, redo the cost sharing arrangement, to restructure Lockheed's team? Okay, that, that's a fair statement, and um, let me just sort of reiterate that when we, we had certainly the last test failure, flight test number seven, we embarked on a major, major review, independent government review of the design, uh, of the pedigree of some of the hardware we have, and uh, just to make sure it's clear, when I say pedigree, we go back and look at all the build papers, design papers, test papers associated with the various components that are part of the design. Uh, as part of that review between flight test number seven and flight test number eight, we identified some shortcomings, if you will, in the rigors of some of the testing that we did for the, the various components, the various subsystems, et cetera. We spent that 14 or 15 months between flight test seven and flight test eight 
in some respects, going back and uh, catching up in terms of testing, qualification testing, design margin testing, those sorts of things to make sure we really understand what we have in terms of the design. We also looked at the processes on the part of the contractor for their quality program, their reliability program. The contractor made some significant changes in their uh, corporate and organizational structure to address those. We also looked at personnel to make sure we had the right kinds of, of personnel. Uh, what concerns us, in spite of all those reviews, which have given us confidence in the design itself, confidence in the processes that we now have on the part of the contractor, is that for this, this phase of the program, the hardware we're currently testing is the same hardware we procured uh, four or five years ago. In other words, we're, we're stuck with what we have. Uh, we think it's still very important to proceed with the program and to try to get through these tests to understand uh, will hit to kill in missile defense work? Uh, will this, this concept and this system work? So we're trying to get through these series of tests uh, with the existing hardware rather than stopping altogether, uh, not redesigning, uh, build new hardware, new components to the new processes and start all over. That is going to be a significant hit if we try to do that. So we're trying to scrub everything again, relook at some of the things we looked at previously, understand what happened this particular time, and try to make sure we have the best capability there so we can proceed through the testing and then get into the next phase of the program where we'll have better hardware. Yeah, but why should Lockheed be restructuring again? Why should you be talking to them about cost sharing when you don't even know what went wrong the last time? Well, ultimately, uh, even though the government is ultimately responsible, we have we hired, if you will, uh, Lockheed, uh, Lockheed Martin as our prime contractor to pull all these things together and to help us address all these types of things. Systems engineering, systems integration, successfully getting through testing, having the right kinds of components, et cetera. And so there is culpability uh, on the part of the, the contractor, as you would expect, a prime contractor, uh, and hence uh, we want them to have some share in the burden of this as we get through the next part of the test program. General, if you take all of these programs together, how much are we spending uh, to develop theater missile defenses, and when realistically will, will any of these come to fruition in the sense that there'll be an actual significant upgrade in the ability to defend troops in the field? Okay. Uh, let me just say, I mean, even though some people may, uh, uh, from a qualifying standpoint, uh, quality standpoint, disagree with me, uh, we have significant improvements from Desert Storm today with the Pac-2 gym. Uh, and again, I have to emphasize that because of the tests we've done in the past year where we've actually tested against actual current generation SCUDs and have been very successful. So it's hard for me to say we don't have significant capability compared to Desert Storm. Uh, the real robust capability, the highly effective capability that we know we need, uh, I'm not being naive with my, by my earlier statement, we will have our first generation of those or the first of the new generation with the Pac-3 within the next year. Early in the year 2000 is when we're going to have that capability. We'll have the Navy counterpart, the Navy area, by the end of the year 2000, earlier the part of 2001. The schedules we're currently working for those two programs. The upper tier systems, which we really need to have for the longer range theater uh, ballistic missile threats and for things that may have weapons of mass destruction warhead on them, again, we're still trying to get to that 2006 date for, uh, for THAAD. Uh, granted, we have to look at what all this has done to us in terms of schedule, but we're still trying to get as close to that date as possible. The Navy upper tier program is just now being fleshed out, and our goal is to try to get that as early as we possibly can also. And price tag for all this? Price tag, uh, uh, I, I can't answer that for you right now. I don't have the number off the top of my head because uh, our my portfolio for missile defense includes national missile defense and some other things, and they're all sort of wrapped up in the, together, including infrastructure and testing. Uh, so I can't give you a good number now, but we can get something back to you for the record if you like. General, 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 as I understood uh, before the last test, the, the program was structured so that if you had a successful <coughs> intercept, you would go ahead and make a, a purchase of, I think it was a 20 or 30, some, some significant amount. And this seemed very unusual compared to other programs, so that with one success, you'd go and make a major buy. Are you still planning to do that, and, uh, or is that one of the things you're restructuring? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, it is one of the things we are, we are re-looking at. Uh, we actually had already decided to do that even before that test, but the answer to the question is no. Well, can you tell us how you're restructuring it? Uh, so we're still in the process of doing that. Uh, I'm not trying to hedge in that regard, but we just had a meeting, a uh, major review here in the Pentagon the other day uh, to vet and re-look at all the different options of things that we need to, to do. 
we still have some questions to answer first and then get blessing uh, by the authorities, uh, particularly the Defense Acquisition Executive, Dr. Ganser, before we have this full program, restructure program defined. So, so if I understand it, not only are you looking at things if there are subsequent failures so that Lockheed will pick up the charges, but if there is a, a success, it will not be, you know, the the coffers do not swing open. And we had already decided the, the latter, and the, the two are not necessarily uh, linked together. We were looking at the restructure. There are fact of life things associated with that, just because of slipping schedules and budgets, et cetera. Let me go over here if I can. Steve. Uh, oh, okay. General, the, uh, the troubleshooter you have is from Lockheed Martin. The five review teams are manned by Lockheed Martin, albeit in both cases from their Denver astronautics office. But given their track record, wouldn't it be better to have a more independent, perhaps, government involvement in these review teams? And uh, ordinarily, somebody might, might think that. In some respects, you have to understand and be very familiar with the players involved. Uh, one of the um, things we were a little bit concerned about in the past on the THAAD program is that uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, again, who, uh, who I have great confidence in as a, as a corporation, uh, perhaps did not bring in all of the expertise that was available in this vast uh, uh, and excellent corporation. Uh, in this particular, in the past, in this particular case, they have brought in the best from astronautics, the best from their Vought systems down in uh, uh, down in Dallas. They brought in the best from uh, their corporate headquarters, and and the best from their operations down at uh, Cape Canaveral, involved in the space program. Uh, and I particularly feel confident this time that even though there are Lockheed Martin teams, there are government personnel on each one of these, these teams. Uh, we have some of our best people also on those teams. And more importantly, the team leaders are people who I know from personal experience, one of whom was, I'm, was, uh, I was one of my mentors, um, people who don't care about corporate loyalties. They're going to tell you straight facts of what the story is. And that's the kind of thing we need to make sure we get a good look at this. Who's the troubleshooter? Uh, Mr. Ed Squires is the troubleshooter they brought in from the astronautics uh, division, uh, very successful in, in uh, uh, literally shifting uh, a whole new corporate product, the Atlas launch vehicle from San Diego, the old General Dynamics, up to the Denver operation without a single flaw, misbeat, misschedule, or anything like that, and very successful space, space launches. Also was a troubleshooter that solved some Tomahawk problems years ago in, uh, in General Dynamics. So. Uh, we got, I think, the right personality. Yes, General, Karen. What's, what what, what's your time frame for looking at these options for a possible restructure? And at any point, could you decide, we absolutely don't need a restructure. There will be no restructure. There will be no changes to the program. That's always an option, uh, to, to do nothing different, if you will, from the status quo. Uh, we're looking at all of these things. As I mentioned, we had a major review internal to the building uh, just the other day. And uh, we are scheduled to get answers back into some of the questions that still remain from this review within the next couple of weeks. And then I'm scheduled to get with uh, uh, my boss, with Dr. Ganser, uh, to get concurrence on whatever we may want to do, uh, certainly by the end of the month, and then uh, we'll proceed from there. Can you say who that review was done by a couple days ago that you had in the building? What, well, we, what branch? We or call what? it an OIPT. Uh, and. Um, Overarching independent team. It was co-chaired by me and Dr. George Snyder from OSD, OSD staff. General, you mentioned that we you... We have time for one, two very, very quick questions. Yeah, yeah, we can do, can I, go to somebody who hasn't asked a question then. Uh, the component that you uh, suspect caused this failure in flight test eight, was that specifically tested during that 14 month scrub down in between seven and the thrust, thrust vector control system was tested successfully. It's built, by the way, not by Lockheed Martin, but by Chemical Systems Division of, uh, of um, Pratt & Whitney. Um, th we did test that, um, and it's been tested, actually, the kind of thing we can test on the, the platform, the launch platform, before it's launched. So uh, we, again, don't know exactly what caused that particular short circuit. If I can go General, to somebody else. With respect to the Nietzsche program, again, the authorizers and appropriators have stated that they uh, support the Nietzsche requirement. Uh, there's just some concern that the program's not funded in the out years, and that's, that's a problem with finding money for FY99. With the GAO saying there are real, no real alternatives, and with the SYNCs testifying that they need uh, a system that meets that requirement, what is really the, uh, the problem with finding that money in the palm? And if those determinations aren't made very soon, won't you jeopardize FY99 money for the R to complete the, the cooperative R&D program? Well, as you now? mentioned, we have FY99 money for the program. Our challenge is to try to figure out how to fit it into our, 
uh, POM, uh, Program Objective Memorandum, the 2000 to 2005 budget. Uh, and the issue is, uh, again, one of affordability. We have several, as uh, many of you have already indicated, we have several very important missile defense programs uh, uh, already on our plate that need to be funded, in addition to what we're trying to do for MEADS. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out, for all of missile defense, how do we get uh, all of these things into the budget, recognizing that the Department of Defense has many, many other top priorities. Uh, this is not the only one. And uh, the challenge is how to fit all these things in, and, and can we do so? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.